Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts. I'm Amanda Harrison, a community engagement manager for the DIA. Today, we're taking an inside look at the exhibition By Her Hand, exploring early modern Italian women artists from the 15 to 1800s with trained docents Cindy Patrick and Ray Henney. Christine Mark, our manager of volunteer development, is here to take your questions throughout the program. So to ask a question, please log into YouTube using your Gmail account or by leaving a public comment on this Facebook page. Today, I want you to pay special close attention because at the end, we'll have a trivia question. The first person to email the correct answer to community engagement at dia.org will receive a by her hand catalog. This beautiful catalog can be yours by correctly answering the trivia question at the end. So please uh, pay attention and Ray will be reading the trivia question at the end. And to get us started, please welcome Ray Henney and Cindy Patrick. Hey everybody. Hello Amanda, hi Cindy. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. March, as you may know, is Women's History Month. And although uh, the exhibition wasn't scheduled um, to coincide with Women's History Month, the coincidence of its relevance can't be ignored. So I hope that you'll uh, enjoy what Ray and I are going to present for you today. So during our presentation today, we'll be exploring the role of women artists in the male-dominated Italian world of art from the years between 1500 and 1800. An already exceptional exhibition in the hands of Eve Strassman Flanzer, Lara Rooney, and their DIA team it has been masterfully reinterpreted and elevated to extraordinary. Please, you have to come into the museum and see it. It's a magnificent exhibition. It, the it's 17th, beautiful. It's absolutely it is. It's, it is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the 17 women artists on view struggled to defy the many obstacles and challenges that were presented during their careers. Their technical skills and their ingenuity is revealed in 57 individual works of art. We will see confident self-portraits, realistic still lifes, scenes of women's bravery, and religious themes. Denied academic training, they often depended on their male family members for their art education, and only later in the 18th century were they finally permitted to attend drawing classes, but only in the company of other women. During their careers, they were sometimes belittled and harshly critiqued in literature and art, and many of their male peers wouldn't recognize their merits. We'll begin today's talk with images that are in chronological order, starting with the Renaissance artist Sofonispa Inguasola, and her works from the 1500s, and concluding with the Florentine artist Anna Baccarini Piatoli, whose career continued late into the 1700s. So with that, Ray, let's begin. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, next slide, please. So as Cindy was indicating, as you enter the gallery, the first works you see are the earliest paintings in the exhibition. The pieces are by Sofonispa Aguisola, who was born in approximately 1535 of parents of minor nobility. Um, as Cindy was saying, uh, she defied the conventional expectations of the then male dominated society. Angu Angu I'm sorry, Anguissola Sola received formal artistic painting instruction at a time when women were not generally afforded professional training away from home. Anguissola be overcame many societal barriers and prejudice to enjoy a somewhat successful and distinguished career as a painter. This first piece is a self-portrait uh, from about 1556, which is only about three inches tall and is made of varnished wall, um, watercolor on parchment. Anguissola is believed to have created multiple versions of this self-portrait distributed them to potential patrons as, you know, she was trying to get Cindy, you know, people interested like royalty or nobility into possibly um, being a, you know, their painter or on commission as their painter. 
And this little self-portrait was meant as self-promotion. It, it contained information such as the artist's skill level, her likeness, and other important attributes. Next slide, please. So the emblem that she is holding is essentially an advertisement. And there's an inscription around the edge. And it says in Italian, the Virgin, Sofonisba Anguissola, depicted by her own hand from a mirror at Carmona. So there's a lot of information there. She mentions being a virgin, uh, and this concerns her unmarried status, and is meant to assure the potential patrons of her worthiness to hire due to her virtue and respectability. Stating that she painted herself by looking into a mirror indicates it is a true likeness and that she is a very skilled portraiture. Now, the, there's uh, symbols in the center of uh, the emblem, and they appear to be Latin, but uh, it's a mystery as to their meaning. Scholars speculate that it could be some sort of code that is unknown today, but likely had meaning to those to whom she would send these paintings. Aguisola's aspirations were realized when she received a royal position and commissions from King Philip II of Spain, who was the predominant um, royalty at that, in Europe at that time. Indeed, King Philip invited her to live in the Spanish royal court. However, because she was female, she was not considered an official royal court painter, but a lady in waiting. And she held that position for over 14 years for two Spanish queens. But consequently, Aguisola had access to royal family and their private living areas. So she spent much time with the family, particularly the royal children. And she completed several paintings of the king and his family. Next slide, please. Cindy, this is, none of these slides do the paintings justice because they're so gorgeous. And this one is particularly, um, suffers uh, virtually and I, I you know, will urge you again to come to the museum to see these because it's a magnificent ex exhibition. Anyway, this oil painting is from 1573 uh, and is most likely King Philip's son, Don Fernando, who was about two years old at the time. Now there's no documentation about Anguissilo of uh, being the you know, artist or this or, uh, this or other royal paintings. Unfortunately, there's very little documentation about this artist in general. As a result, because of the historic bias of the supposed skill level of male artists compared to female artists, and the fact that history has traditionally been written by males, for years this painting was attributed to the male official Spanish court painter of King Philip. As a result, Anguasila's position was historically known uh, only as a lady in waiting. So for hundreds of years, her work as a painter of the Spanish royal family and her contribution to art and art history were unknown. It has only been in the last decade that she has been recognized as painting various portraits of the royal family, including this one. And this is really an interesting portrait. You've got this little boy dressed in a ceremonial hunting uniform of male royalty. And he's holding a spear uh, in his right hand and a hunting knife in his left. I don't know you about you, Cindy, but my two boys, when they were two years old, there's no way I'm going to have them running around with a spear and a knife. Um, in any <laughs> event, notice the expression uh, uh, on the child's face. He looks uh, directly at the viewer. You know, he has this softness of his eyes. And there's a close attention to detail and colors in his clothing. The subject uh, um, looking at the viewer, you know, the subject uh, or the portrait, the person who's being portrait is being made, looking at the viewer, these muted colors and the striking green paint that you see were signature attributes of Aguasila's portraits. And then you have this remarkable green. And the artist is thought to have most likely uh, used local earth pigments mixed with oil to create this uh, you know, several different hues of this vibrant green. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is another painting that has been misattributed to the wrong artist. This oil on canvas painting entitled Young Man is believed to be from the mid 1500s. And it has been in the DI's collection for over 50 years in, uh, and it was attributed to Aguisola. Um, and it has been in storage ever, um, until now. It has not been on view until this exhibition. Interestingly, in connection with this uh, exhibition, the painting was examined by the DIA Conservation Department, who determined that it was not by Aguasella um, and relabeled it as by an unknown artist. Next slide, please. By comparing the young man painting to the painting that is firmly attributed to Aguasella, the viewer can understand how conservation reached that conclusion. The young man painting to the left does have some of Aguisola's style with its green paint and the subject looking directly at the viewer. However, the painting lacks the same attention to detail as the portrait of King Philip's son on the right. For example, the clothing lacks, uh, you know, it doesn't show the typical refinement of brush strokes that captures the texture and contours that Agasilas, I'm sorry, Aguisola's uh, technique. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a tongue twister about that. So for me, the misattribution of the artists of these two paintings is possibly due to the historic bias against the skill level of female painters. The painting that demonstrates a high degree of skill, the portrait of King Philip's son on the right, was historically attributed to a man. While the painting which is much less skillfully executed on the left was historically attributed to a woman. Christine, any questions or should we go on to the next piece? We just have one question, Ray. Uh, in the beginning, Sofonisba Anguissola's self-portrait, that little tiny one with the Latin inscription in the center, uh, the question was, was that a form of um, advertisement? Was that her calling card? That's an excellent way of putting it. It's as though she passed out a business card. Um, and it, uh, it was unique for women to be the, um, this forward, if you will, in, in promoting themselves. But it, I understand it was not unique for men artists to do that, to sort of give a free sample to see if uh, the patron would be interested in them. Okay, great. Thank you. Cindy? I don't know if you noticed, Ray, but I'm wearing my Artemisia Gentileschi pins Look from at our you. gift shop. Yeah, I've got the power of, of Gentileschi right now, right, right on my chest. Um, so continuing on, Artemisia Gentileschi was an artist. We know that. And uh, unusually, she was a woman who was a driving force uh, during the 17th century of Baroque painting. The works that we're going to see next uh, really kind of anchored the exhibition. Um, by the time she was 15 years old, her father had recognized her great talent as a painter. It was unusual for women to be allowed to train as painters and uh, even more unusual for them to be trained outside of their family circle. But her father did hire a professional teacher for her. After marrying, she and her new husband, they relocated to Florence. And it was here that her career really started to flourish. She was the first woman to be accepted into the Academy of Arts and Drawing in Florence. And in Florence, she worked tirelessly to discover influential buyers for her work and to build a reputation as an accomplished painter. She was driven to be treated as a professional, paid well, and recognized for her extraordinary talent. The quote that you see in front of us here says, a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen. And it's a direct reference to her having to con constantly defend the quality and the monetary value of her work. She returned to Rome in the early 1620s with her husband, and her one surviving daughter, Prudentia, who was named after her mother. The couple later became estranged and she continued to work as the sole supporter of herself and her daughter. Uh, Christine, if we don't have any questions, we'll go to the next slide. 
this this uh, painting isn't part of the exhibition, but we are showing it uh, here today so that we can give you a little bit more background about her history. And for those of you who might have attended uh, the presentation that Ray and I did on Baroque art, we did go go into a lot of detail uh, regarding this young woman with a violin, St. Cecilia. So this painting is by Orazio Gentileschi, father of Artemisia Gentileschi. And he painted this portrait of St. Cecilia using his daughter as his model. According to the story, story despite a vow of virginity, St. Cecilia's parents forced her to marry. During the wedding, she sat apart, singing to God from her heart. So you can see that her eyes are cast upward outside of the actual picture plane. She's looking up toward, I guess we'll say the sky, heaven. Um, and, for, um, and for singing to God from her heart, she was later declared the patron saint of musicians. In 1599, her body was unearthed, and this led to a renewed popularity of her as a martyr. Hence, a lot of commissions to have her painted in portraits. So, you know, today we're lucky enough to have many examples of St. Cecilia um, and most of them painted during the Baroque era, which would have been, you know, in the early 1600s. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please, Kathleen. Thank you. So again, we have St. Cecilia on the left and then on the right, we have a sketch of Orazio. Um, he was an accomplished artist with a lifetime of important commissions from the Catholic Church and the ruling class. The intimacy that he enjoyed with his patrons while painting their portraits led to his title as a diplomat and an envoy in the service of his own nation. So he was a pretty important, pretty important artist and a pretty important uh, man among the court. At the time of his death at 77 years of age, Artemisia Gentileschi was far more renowned than her father. She had already been commissioned by Philip IV of Spain and most of the crown heads of Europe. Kathleen, if we could go to the next. Thank you. So you can see here three paintings. They are all of one face, Artemisia Gentileschi. So you can see the one on the left, self-portrait as a lute player. The center is self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria. And then on the right, Again, St. Catherine of Alexandria. We show you the three together um, so that we can compare and contrast uh, her treatment of not only her own self-portrait, but also two of uh, treatments of the saint. So we know that Genileski traveled widely to pursue her career. She was all over Europe. She, she was commissioned at several of the courts of Europe. As she moved about, she strategically adapted to attract new buyers. In these three paintings, which were all done while she was in Florence, we can see how she used the same self-portrait as the basis for all of them. She used herself as the model for numerous paintings, even beyond these. Uh, we'll look at these three, which are in the exhibition. All three take on their own personas. There are deliberate changes that have been made in each painting. As you can see, they were all done between 1615 and 1617. And you know, I tried to go, um, on the internet and see if I could actually get the order within which they were painted, but it, it only says circa 1615. So we really don't know. Um, we can kind of guess that the one on the right was the last. Um, we don't know if the three paintings we see were commissioned for patrons or if they were gifts given to patrons, but we do know that the self-portrait as a lute player, which is on the left, ended up with the royal family of Florence the Medici. And Kathleen, if you could go to the next, please. So here you can see some of the, um, this is an, an X radiograph, X ray, uh, that's been done by Conservation Lab to show the underpainting and the underdrawing or cartoon that was used under this specific painting of St. Catherine of, Alexand of Alexandria. Um, the red lines kind of trace the shape of the original figure, which was hidden underneath St. Catherine as she appears in the final painting on the right. The original traced figure shows that the image matches the first two paintings, and it's the same in the underdrawing, but was altered in the final composition to reflect a St. Catherine whose eyes are looking up with slight changes in the tilt of her head. This change was intentional with the second St. Catherine in a skyward gaze. Next slide, please. 
Here we compare the two St. Catharines side by side to see where the differences and similarities converge from Artemisia gentileschi's own face. So if we take a look at the one on the left, you can see that she's holding uh, the attributes of the saint, which are a palm frond and then um, a broken wheel. And actually it was a wheel that was used for torture. She has on a scarf or we'll call it a turban and uh, the position of her arms is pretty similar to the one on the right. However, if you look above the turban, it's a little bit difficult to see uh, in this image, but there's a crown that was painted in and also a halo over the crown. And it's believed that those were added at a later, at a later date. So notice that the palm front almost is, you know, perpendicular to the, the bottom of the picture plane. And the, um, the wheel of torture is kind of almost intersecting that palm frond. Now, why she chose in the painting on the right to move that palm frond from the center of the painting to the left, and you can hardly see the wheel, and you definitely can't see the fact that it's been broken. Um, you know, the neck, uh, she's detailed the neck, and it's much longer. Um, we don't have a turban or a scarf, and she has a full crown on her head. And this crown actually matches a crown that was worn by um, Fer Ferdinand of the, of the Medici family. So she may have used that as her model for this crown when she painted this, uh, this particular painting of St. Catherine. So if we go to the next one, we will talk a little bit more about. So the original painting that she sketched from was called Self-Portrait as a Lute Player. So why did Artemisia put herself in these paintings and, and use her own visage for these self-portraits? Well, she was trying to intertwine her personal identity with, with the subjects, so either the lute player or with St. Catherine. It was considered an asset during the 1600s to be artistically trained in music. So as an example in Self-Portrait as a Lute Player, she's showing herself you know, actively playing um, an instrument. We're pretty sure that she didn't have musical training and she actually couldn't play a lute. Um, but in the Medici court circles in Florence where she painted, um, musicians were valued and afforded respect. So she wasn't known to play an instrument, but by associating herself with that talent and in this very theatrical treatment of this image, She's announcing one of the many appropriated identities that she used in her self-portraits. Uh, she depicted herself again, as we said, as St. Catherine and also uh, depicted herself as an Amazon. Now, you know, I, I in my own mind and others have said this too, how, how audacious it was for someone to paint their own face um, in the guise of a saint, but this was very common practice and very accepted um, during this period of time. You know, if you go into our um, our Renaissance galleries at the DIA, you'll see several paintings where uh, members of the ruling class, you know, have their own visage painted in the guise of a saint. Um, the image shows her at the peak of her youth, her beauty and her talent. Her cheeks are blushed and the emphasis on her highlighted bosom is kind of a little bit provocative and daring. So this was meant, this, this was kind of meant to be an advertisement for Artemisia. She was really putting herself out there. She was adept at self-promotion and she used her own visage in paintings like this to help her get her and her painting talents noticed. Next slide, please. So in this self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria, as I said, you know, we, we have the turban or scarf wrapped around her head. And this might even be, um, might even hearken to the idea of a Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L. You know, we see Sybils all over the ceiling of um, the Sistine Chapel. So, you know, she may, be, she may be associating herself with a Sybil. But then again, we have the crown and we have the halo. So um, St. Catherine, who was she? She was elevated to sainthood for defying an emperor with her staunch defense of her own Christian faith. The palm frond in her hand 
serves as an attribute representing the victory of spirit over flesh. The spoked and spiked wheel was the same as those that were used on wooden transport carts of the time. Uh, she was sentenced to be subjected to torture by a spiked wheel, but was saved when it miraculously broke. When the execution failed, it was interpreted as God's intervention. However, unfortunately, she was later beheaded. Poor St. Catherine. And if we could go to the next, please. Ah. And now we're going to uh, continue with Ray and his, um, his information about Judith. This painting is is really probably the anchor of the exhibition. And this is one of the paintings that is actually in the collection of the Detroit Institute of Arts. Take it away, Ray. Thanks. Uh, so this is a wonderful painting. Completed by Artemisia in approximately uh, 1625, Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes is a large painting. It's seven and a half feet tall and over six feet wide. As um, Cindy was saying, it is in the DIA's con the collection. It's frequently on view and is considered to be among the artist's finest works. It demonstrates her innovation and skill. Next slide, please. In fact, the DIA painting is so accepted as a great masterpiece that it was the cover painting for the catalog of a recent exhibition of Artemisia's work at the National Gallery in London. Next slide, please. So the story being depicted here is from uh, the book of Judith that is included in some branches of the Christian Bible's uh, Old Testament. Uh, briefly, the story is that the Assyrian king Nebuchadnezzar sent his general, Holofernes, to subdue his enemy, the Jews. The Assyrian army besieged Judith's town and the Jews rapidly lost hope of victory. Judith was a strikingly beautiful widow who overheard the Jewish leader's plans to surrender the city. So she, she became a, an activist. She crept into the Assyrian camp, seduced Holofernes with her captivating beauty, waited till he was thoroughly drunk, and then cut his head off. She returned to her people victorious, holding his severed head as a trophy, where well, the Jewish people regained their courage, raided the Assyrian camp, and they drove the enemy away. The story of Judith was particularly popular to Italians because in the 15th through the 18th century, Italian principalities and republics were constantly under the threat of conquest by foreign regimes. Judith's story represented the small overcoming the oppression of the powerful to maintain their independence. So at the time, many artists, particularly Italian artists, painted the story of Judith in Holofernes. Next slide, please. Here is a painting of the story of Judith done by Titian, uh, you know, the famous Titian, which is in the DIA's collection and is currently on display. Notice the, you know, Cindy, you've got this grotesque head that is front and center and the maidservant is being depicted as a person of color. Next slide, please. In fact, Artemisia painted different compositions of the story. These two paintings, which she completed 10 years before the DIA painting, are in the collections of the Uffizi's and the Naples Museum. Now these paintings are shown in the exhibition only in a short film about Artem Artemisia. They're not actually on display at the uh, exhibition. But notice, Cindy, how gory these scenes are. I mean, you've got the knife, the blood, uh, you know, spurting out and everything. And actually this kind of goriness is typically or very commonly depicted by many artists. However, next slide, please. The DIA painting has extreme drama due in part to the lighting, the closeness of the figures, and the accent of the red drape or cloth. But the painting does not have any of the gore. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, the head of Holofernes is difficult to detect at the bottom of the painting. Visitors to the museum often do not notice it. The focus is not on the head or the decapitation, 
but the psychology of the dramatic moment through the use of light in the composition of the figures. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kathleen. The women appear to have been startled by a noise. You know, you can see them both looking up in the same direction. You know, perhaps somebody's looking outside the tent. And Judith, it was very dramatic, and Judith holds up her hand as if to signal, you know, don't move. Or perhaps she's trying to guard the light so their figures don't cast shadows that might be seen outside the tent. Artemisia here demonstrates considerable skill because painting light in this manner is extremely difficult. Next slide, please. Here we focus on Judith's maidservant, Abra, in two respects. First, there's um, Artemisia's amazing technical ability in painting Abra's head at a difficult angle. You know, it, it is turned to, to add drama to the moment, turned and tilted, which um, I understand is an extremely difficult um, way to uh, paint perspective. The second focus is on who Abra is. Many times the maidservant is depicted as a woman of mature age or in Titian's painting, a detail of which is on the bottom right, a person of a different race or ethnicity. But Artemisia portrays Abra as a comparatively beautiful young woman. She is more humbly dressed than Judith, but her clothes are still lovely. Uh, these elements contribute to this sort of sense of sisterhood, if you will. It's a compositional structure emphasizing women heroically working together. For me, only a, a woman artist, a great woman artist of great skill, such as Artemisia, could create such a unique perspective on this ancient story. Christine, do we have any uh, questions about Artemisia? Actually, there's one question about our DIA's Artemisia Gentileschi painting. One of the viewers noticed that there's a crescent moon on uh, Judith's face and was wondering if you could, if that means something. You know, I don't know if it means something. Um, it, it is interesting. Um, uh, it, it, and there's this drama because skillfully, uh, the shadow is from the hand. Uh, you know, uh, on the on the face, but I don't know, um, Christine, if there's another symbolism, which there may be uh, in a in a baroque painting like this. Yeah, there's many symbols in the picture. We have the um, the red curtains up in the right hand corner, and and doesn't that um, uh, scream theatrical? You know, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. It really adds to the drama, as I mentioned. It really mm -hmm. does. It, and it gives us tightness, too. Yeah. Did you mention uh, that the DIA recently cleaned this painting? I, I did not. But um, on its way to London, before it was uh, on loan in London, the Conservation Department uh, did clean this. And also the Titian that we showed beforehand, mm -hmm. it went through an extensive conservation. And it took off the yellow varnish that was on the Titian. So mm -hmm. it's a must-see. It's it's up on the DIA. Um, well, I know that this um, Artemisia Gentileschi painting is much brighter. And it's much easier to see the dark sh what's behind the dark shadows than it was b before uh, the DIA cleaned it. So absolutely, the slide doesn't do it justice. Oh, no. And, 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 we, and uh, Christine, and you've seen it. it it's lit so dramatically and beautifully in the exhibition. It mm -hmm. really uh, is an eye popper. And it's so large. It's so large. <laughs> yeah. It's bigger than life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, oh, also the other thing was, uh, there was a question about the Titian. And um, the Titian is not in the exhibition. It's hanging in the galleries. So right. if you want to see the Titian, go to the galleries and take a look at it. I think, Ray, um, you were making a comparison as to um, the subject matter of Judith and the right, no, I, I, it, right yeah. being so popular in the 1600s. Yeah, uh, Titian was the Venetian master and is, you know, is credited as being uh, among the great artists of the Renaissance period. Absolutely. Right. Right. But I think you were making the point that it, the subject matter of Judith was super popular. It was extremely popular. Yeah. yeah. I think the DIA also has a sculpture of Judith, and it might be in the adjacent gallery or right in the same gallery with the Titian. 
So uh -huh. yes, it, it was ve very, very popular uh, theme, just as St. Cecilia was, you know, around 1600. And there's mm -hmm. another Judas in the exhibition, uh, which we mm -hmm. won't be covering today, but by a different artist. Yeah, so you can, uh, everybody all who's watching, you can go and see another Judith in the exhibition. Uh, there's one of the viewers wants to know um, approximately how many works of art are done similar to the DIA's Judith piece. And we've talked about this before, and the answer is that we, we're not really sure, but we did throw a couple in, and it's a good segue um, to the slide that you're looking at right now. Um, and we, I'm not going to go into this, uh, uh, Ray, um, maybe I think Cindy does this, but, uh, the question was the famous artist Caravaggio, uh, what, how did he influence Artemisia? Did he know Artemisia? Uh, it's kind of a, a side question. Um, and, uh, Orazio, uh, I, I, go ahead, Christy, yeah. was, uh, Artemisia's father was actually, uh, buddies with Caravaggio and, uh, and so he did um, influence Artemisia in her um, dramatic darks and lights and using that style. So uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, turn it back to the team and uh, we should go on and look at the next Judith. It's the next Judith. Thank you. Okay. So this is Rosaba Carriera. Uh, she was the most famous woman artist of the 18th century. And I should point out, unfortunately, this lovely self-portrait of her is not on in the exhibition, but we wanted to show it so you could see the likeness um, of the artist. She was born in Venice, um, and she began her career painting miniature portraits on small pieces of ivory. She then turned to pastel portraits and became the first Italian, man or woman, to work consistently with pastels. And this was revolutionary. Pastels generally were only used for preparatory work, but Carriera in innovatively used them for finished works to great acclaim. In 1720, uh, she visited Paris where she executed portraits of royalty, including the young Louis the, uh, XV. In the mid uh, 1720s, she returned to Venice to stay and she, was she fulfilled many distinguished uh, collector's uh, commissions, including royalty, uh, such as the King of Poland. She became so in demand and so famous that she was known in Venice only by her first name, kind of like Madonna uh, or something. Um, Cher, that's a better example. <laughs> in the 18th century, Venice was one of the important cultural centers in Europe. And it was a must-see stop for Europeans touring Italy, and Carriera was a must-see artist. Carriera clearly had uh, business savvy. She uh, located her studio on the high traffic area of the uh, Grand Canal, where all the tourists could pass by. Her pastels and paintings were purchased in the droves by tourists who put them uh, you know, who took them back to their countries. Consequently, her pastels became incredibly popular all over Europe. She also became a, uh, a teacher of painting. Women who would learn in her studio were given the opportunity to gain artistic knowledge and training under her guidance. Next slide, please. Among the works in the exhibition related to Carriera are these two wonderful pastels on blue paper both of which are in the DIA's collection and they're rarely seen. Uh, this is because pastels can only be shown for short periods of time or they'll deteriorate. These works demonstrate Carriera's new kind of portraiture. She departed from that stuffy old style that required the subject to sit for hours and hours toward a portraiture that had a sort of a freshness and an informal, informal feeling. Uh, next slide, please. This DIA pastel, which Carriera uh, completed in approximately 1741, shows her informal style. It is named after an Egyptian queen, an ancient Egyptian queen, Berenice. The subject soldiers are casually tipped as if she's in motion, giving the composition sort of a feeling of liveliness. 
there is this added playful area at layer of fun and mystery because Carriera would often display her sitters in different disguises to play, you know, a role, you know, like a, a figure for maybe from history or, or mythology. Here, the sitter takes on the role of Berenicia, whose most cherished asset was her hair. The story goes that when her husband set off for war, she snipped precious curls, her, one of her precious curls, and gave it to him as sort of a good luck charm uh, to protect him. Carriera shows the sitter with sitter, scissors in the act of cutting her hair. We do not know the identity of the sitter, but the particularities of the features uh, this suggests that it was meant to be a portrait of an actual person whose identity is just now unknown. This work demonstrates Carriera's remarkable mastery of pastels. Notice the dazzling textural effects of the skin, the hair, and the clothes. There is this sort of touchable softness to her skin and that shimmering gauziness of the orange sleeve. I was fortunate, Cindy, to take my brother and sister-in-law to the exhibition on Friday. And while they were all wonderful, it was really rewarding for us to be able to see this in person because it's so rarely shown and it's so really an extraordinarily different kind of composition. Well, interestingly, Carriera was so popular during her time that she created sort of an in-demand brand or a celebrity. Consequently, she had followers of her style and the use of pastels. However, somewhat notoriously, uh, she was copied. Many copied her style and fraudulently tried to sell them as her works. Next slide, please. The pastel to the right is in the DIA's collection on loan. This is the work of St. Cecilia from sometime in the uh, 1730s. And, and, and Cindy was talking about St. Cecilia when, when she was talking about Janeliski's father and showing one of his paintings. Unlike uh, the pastel to the left, this pastel uh, is not definitely attributed to Carriera, but to her circle. The St. Cecilia pastel clearly imitates Carriera's style with the tipped shoulders and the softness of the hair and, and clothes. But it does not have the technical excellence of works firmly attributed to Carrera. The current prevailing thought is that this was probably done by one of her students. And this is important. Um, as the, uh, the DIA's researcher of uh, Italian art indicates, her name is Laura uh, Rooney. She, she says this is, this is a very important part of the legacy of Carriera. That, you know, prior to this time, only men taught uh, women to be painters. But Carriera was part of a 18th century trend of self-empowerment of women artists, with women artists training other women. Cindy? Thank you, Ray. Uh, so moving on to Elisabetta Serrani, and like Carriera, she also um, taught women to paint. So we have a, a whole new, uh, a whole new genre of female artists who are becoming empowered and who are taking on the mantle of um, educating others. So according to written records, she died at 27. Um, so she had, although she had a short life. She had already produced over 200 paintings, drawings, and etchings. So she was very prolific in that short time. She started uh, her career at about the age of 19. So in less than 10 years, she had cre you know, created a large body of work. Um, she ran her family's workshop. Her father was an artist. She supported her parents, her three siblings, and herself entirely through her art. So she really was a self-made self woman. She spent her entire life in Bologna. So unlike Gentileschi, who traveled widely and was a court painter, uh, Serrani stayed, you know, in her in her local uh, confine and in a city that was famous for its progressive attitude towards women's rights and for producing successful female artists. So things have ch have changed. You know, we're in a, an area of uh, what is today Italy, where women are now being embraced as artists. 
and the obstacles that they have to overcome are are lessened. Uh, you know, when we talked earlier, when we were doing our uh, rehearsal for this, Christine pointed out that it's important to think about the fact that in this exhibition, we cover a span of 300 years. So what was happening for artists like Jen Tileski, um, and the obstacles that she faced were certainly starting to lessen, you know, toward the end of that time period, we'll say in the late 1700s. I'm going to talk a little bit about her death before we move on to the work of art that we're going to be taking a look at. But here she is shown um, with a portrait of her father. Um, when she died, and it was a, su a sudden death, and it was after experiencing stomach pains, her father suspected that she had been poisoned by a jealous maid. Interesting intrigue. Um, the servant was tried, but was acquitted of this crime. Later, an autopsy revealed numerous lacerations in her stomach. Presumably, they were the evidence of perforated ulcers. I mention her death because she died at such, such a young age and at really the top of her career and fame. So as a result, her funeral was an elaborate affair. It involved formal orations, special poetry that was written about her and music that was written for her, and an enormous catafalque, which is something sort of like a folly. Um, it was 13 feet high, and it was decorated with a life-size sculpture of Serrani. That's how venerated she was in Bologna. Um, in the exhibition, we don't have it in our presentation today, but there is an engraving that actually shows what that catafalque looked like. So if you if you happen to go to the exhibition, make sure you stop and, and, and take a look at that. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I'm wearing Portia, right? I think she's over here. So Portia, wounding her thigh. When we talk about blood and gore, um, it doesn't quite reach the level of those Judith uh, paintings that Ray was you know, showing us a little bit ago but it's pretty gory. Um, the visual story here is about Portia. She was the wife of Brutus and he had conspired to kill Julius Caesar. In this story from Plutarch, Portia stabs her own thigh to show Brutus that his secrets can be trusted with her. The secrets won't be revealed even under the pain of torture. Uh, so you can see she's wielding something in her hand. You, she's got her leg, you know, exposed. We can see there's blood dripping from that thigh. And then there's some activity going on in the background. So we'll get to that. She is still holding the weapon. Uh, I'm sorry. She chose to show the moment. Serrani chose to show the moment when Portia has stabbed herself, the theatrical drama of the precise moment, not unlike the Judith painting that the DIA owns. It's a precise moment in time, very dramatic, captures your attention. Um, she's still holding the weapon she used for the self-inflicted wound. It's a tool that would have been familiar to women. It was either a sewing needle from an embroidery box or perhaps a manicuring tool from a toiletry set. And I'm pretty sure that in the exhibition, there's, um, there is a, a call out that shows a, a toiletry set that something like this might have come from. Now in the background, you can see there's some activity. And there are three women who are engaged in domestic work. They're, they're sewing, which was proper work for 17th century women of this respectable class. But Serrani chose to physically separate Portia from the other wo women with a wall. Can you see kind of going down the middle of uh, the painting, right where her hand is holding that tool? There's um, the, you know, the, the end of a wall or a doorway. Uh, she sets her outside of the traditionally expected or um, allowable activities for women. So, you know, we know that she is very different from the women that are in that room behind her. Uh, Serrani was commissioned to paint this artwork for a silk and fabric merchant from Bologna. She made certain to impress her patron with Portia's attire. Look at the elaborate clothing she's wearing, Ray. The boot that she has on, it's trimmed with gold braid the beautiful red on the dress, the gold jewelry that goes across her shoulder, um, you know, the absolutely sumptuous uh, red dress that she's wearing. She, it sounds uh, like you're uh, trying to convince your husband as to what you want for your next birthday. <laughs> everything except that, everything except that tool she has in her hand. Yeah, you, you don't need that, no. <laughs> don't need that. Um, the fabrics 
are sumptuous. And e if you notice, even the lining of the dress, which is in the bottom right, is sewn with the finest of pattern fabrics. So this attention to detail was aimed at pleasing the patron. And if you'll go back just for a moment, um, Kathleen, if you look at her face, and then if we move forward again to Portia, this is just me, but I almost think that Portia's face kind of looks like Serrani's face. So I don't know if she modeled for this. There isn't any information anywhere that says so, but you know, there is kind of a resemblance there. Uh, okay, Kathleen, thank you. If we can go to the next. Uh, before we start this one, uh, did we have any questions, Chris? Um, we actually um, have a comment that the person says that uh, your presentation thus far has very much enriched their understanding of the exhibition and uh, and it makes them want to go back and see it again. So, oh, that's such a nice yeah, so you're, comment. Yeah. You're, 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 <laughs> it's worth another look. That's right. Your great. audience <laughs> is engaged today. So, great. Congratulations for that. Uh, so, here we have another self portrait. This is by Giovanna Garzoni. And Garzoni and Gentileschi most likely knew each other. Um, they track, you know, there is plenty of information and travel documentation that they were in the same places at the same times, whether it be Florence or at court in England or at court in Spain. Um, so their paths crossed. There, there is some information that sort of points to the idea that they may have at one point even traveled together. That's not verified, but we're pretty sure that they did know each other. So Garzoni's self-portrait is sort of a takeoff on Artemisia Gentileschi's self-portrait. It's an advertisement where she's appropriating the guise of Apollo, the god of music. Um, and she's wearing this uh, wreath of laurel, which laurel is actually bay leaf. So she's got bay leaves around her head. And the attribute um, or symbolism of bay leaves or a, laurel, or a laurel wreath made of bay leaves um, points to the idea of the fact that these um, these headdresses were awarded to victors in sporting competitions back in Greek and Roman times. So it it's saying to her public, uh, you know, I'm victorious, I'm famous. She was a musician, um, so she's showing that you know, showing herself as the god of music, much as. Uh, Artemisia was painted as St. Cecilia, the patron saint of, of musicians. So this isn't in the exhibition, but we wanted you to see what she looked like. And we wanted to point out to you that, you know, they, they, they did use each other's techniques for trying to draw in pa patronage. Uh, if we can move to the next, please. So Gentileschi and Garzoni were both acquainted with men who made dramatic breakthrough, breakthroughs in science. We know that in Florence, Artemisia had befriended uh, the astronomer and physicist Galileo. We know that Giovanna belonged uh, to a group of scientists who were studying botany, flora, fauna. And we also know that the microscope had been newly invented. So there was a lot of interest in nature and um, as I said, flora and fauna. There were major collectors of art, scientific materials, and natural history at the time. So what does an artist do? An artist creates things that people would, might want to buy. So Garzoni was pretty, pretty intelligent um, to choose some of her, uh, her subject matter. But lest you think she only did uh, floral and still life, she also did portraits. She did still life. She did many, many types of paintings. But here we're going to take a look at a hedgehog in a landscape. And I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I really love hedgehogs. And I have a whole bunch of them. And if I could take this laptop around this room I'm in, I could show you at least 10 of them right from where I'm sitting. So this is not a small work of art. It's actually quite large. I was surprised by that when I went into the exhibition. And you can see her technique as a drafts person is unbelievable. You know, she has picked out each one of the spines on this hedgehog's back. Who knows how long it would have taken for her to create just that part of this of this painting. Um, 
she also has used an interesting technique in that she's kind of mirrored or reflected the shape of the hedgehog with those two little brown chestnuts that are sitting in front in the center front of him and also with the pebbles that are over to the right and if you think about it the hedgehog was pretty spiny if you would touch his back you know it would probably prick, prick your hand prick your fingers so she's kind of offset that and and i guess um contrasted it with the softness of the oak leaves and also the softness of that little snail that's down at the left. Um, when you see this in person, you're struck by the fact that that entire foreground is painted with minuscule dots. It kind of reminded me of an impressionist Surratt painting where he did the pointillism technique. Well, uh, Garzoni was doing this, you know, long before. So uh, there are just millions of dots. And she repeated that technique. That was a technique that she used to um, bring out shadow um, in her paintings. So in the 1600s, she earned a living. She supported herself. She had many avid collectors, which was rare for a woman artist. Um, as we said, she learned to paint within her family circle as a young woman. Uh, when she traveled, her brother accompanied her because a woman wasn't allowed to travel alone. And um, botany and the cataloging of the natural world and collecting specimens, as we said, was popular in the 1600s. Um, the DIA also has in its collection uh, some floral still lifes up in our Dutch galleries by the artist Rachel Reutsch, and they were painted around the same time. So there was this interest in Europe um, to document, uh, you know, the science of, of the things that were being seen more closely. Um, so she died in Rome at the age of 70 and was a very successful woman painter of her century. And she is interred at the church of Santa Martina in Rome. And she left her entire estate to that church. So with that, I'm going to take it back to Ray for the close and, um, Hopefully you'll enjoy this last this last painting that we're going to take a look at. Take it away, Ray. So the exhibition ends as it began. The visitor is greeted to the exhibition with a self-promoting self-portrait to the right by the 16th century painter at Guisola. And it, it departs the exhibition. The visitor departs the exhibition with another self-promoting self-portrait to the left by the 18th century artist, Anna Piatoli. Uh, next slide, please. This Frank looking portrait is, is named Frankly, self-portrait at the age of 56, completed in 1776. This highly versatile Florentine artist uh, painted the entire range of subject matters from small portraits to large historical renderings. Uh, she used oil paints and she also used pastels. In this self-portrait, Pia Toli is alluding to those various talents. She signifies her versatility as an artist with that miniature before her uh, on the desk. And then behind her, she has that large canvas uh, signaling her ability to also paint very large uh, commissions. So she's also, uh, you know, showing her skill here because, uh, you know, she's painting a portrait that captivates the likeness and character of the subject. Piatoli unapologetically is showing herself at the age of 56, which at the time uh, was considered a, a very advanced age. There's no obvious effort here at photoshopping or at over idolizing herself. Her face is depicted genuinely, as one would expect an 18th century, 56-year-old woman to look. Her eyes are surrounded by pink and wrinkles, and her hair is gray. Her clothes are nice, but they're modest. Importantly, uh, Piatoli shows herself as a professional at work with a paintbrush in her right hand. Next slide, please. While Pia Toli's self-portrait shares the advertising aspects of the self-promoting self-portraits in the exhibition, there's a significant difference. Unlike the other artists who are youthful and attractive, Pia Toli's self-portrait shows herself in the twilight of her career. 
dignified and confident in their age and talents. Next slide, please. At the time she painted this self-portrait, Pia Tolley was recently widowed and experiencing financial difficulty. She wrote that she created this work for the Grand Duke of Florence in the hopes that he would pay for her painting and she ambitiously hoped that he would display it uh, among other famous artists painting hung in the Grand Duke's gallery, which is currently known as the Uffizi. Indeed, that was her greatest ambition, that she was determined to be recognized as an equal among uh, the mostly male artists of the uh, Grand Duke's collection. The Grand Duke did pay for the painting, which uh, assisted her financially. And after, uh, shortly after he received it, the Grand Duke had this painting hung in the Uffizi Gallery alongside other great artists' painting. Uh, and, that, and, and as I understand it, the self-portrait has been shown ever since. Cindy, what a wonderful piece to end the exhibition and this presentation. An outstanding woman artist finding a place among the great male artists. Christine, if we don't have any burning questions, I'd like to do, um, talk about our, well, let me, let me uh, first interrupt and give you the trivia question. Sounds uh, good, that, Ray. Yeah, the trivia question for today uh, in order to get the catalog to this outstanding exhibition. So the question is, what was the name of the maidservant in Artemisia's Judith and her maidservant with the head of hollow furnace? So that's the question, the name of the maidservant. Uh, Christine, any questions? Um, oh, Amanda just- uh, Oh, that's right, I'm uh, sorry, yeah, email. Yeah, send, yeah. Your, send your answer, you can post your answer if you want, but you also need to email communityengagement at dia.org. And the first person to answer the question correctly will receive that gorgeous exhibition catalog. It's large, it's heavy, it's a perfect coffee table book. <laughs> It, it, yeah, it is just beautiful. Um, well, only one comment. The last piece, the Piatoli piece, uh, I learned that that is uh, Eve Flanser Strassman, our, um, our head uh, curator. That's her favorite piece in the entire exhibition. So uh, we all have our favorites, and, and this one is our, our lead uh, curator's favorite. The frankness is wonderful, but when you see it in person, the cloth, the brush stroke on the clothing is really remarkable. Again, this one suffers like the others, uh, being virtual and not in person. Well, and we you know, you know, Ray, there was one other little thing I noticed while you were talking about this last painting. It was painted in 1776, which was the end of the American Revolution. So it's kind of interesting to put it in um, on a timeline with what was happening in in America. It was the start to... of the revolution, but exactly, yes. It was. I'm sorry, yes, start yeah, of the revolution. Yeah, yes, exactly. Kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, it gives so, us it gives us a global view, doesn't it, of of what was going on in in the world, in the rest of the world. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So uh, that question again, uh, Ray, do you want to repeat it one more? Yes. Time? What was the name of the maidservant in Artemisia's Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes? So we want to thank you, uh, everybody, for being there, and hopefully we'll have a winner soon. Um, again, the first person to email in will be, will be nailed the catalog. So the DIA is open. Uh, it's open uh, Tuesday and Thursdays from 9 to 4, Fridays 9 to 9, and Saturday and Sunday 10 to 5, uh, including by her hand the other exhibitions that are um, currently going, I is Detroit Style, Car Design in the Motor City, extremely popular. It ends June 5th, Black, Black Vanguard, Photography Between Art and Fashion. Uh, that ends on April 17th. It's gorgeous. I urge you to come down to see that also. And then also we have an, a special exhibition for Detroit artist, Detroit legend artist, uh, Shirley Woodson. It's called Shield of the Nile Reflections. And that ends on June 14th. I wanna thank Amanda, Harris for producing, of course, Christine Mark, our director of, of our, um, and trainer of the IPVs, and our other producer, Kathleen McBroom, who is helping us with the talk today with the slides. 
Next week, Kathleen will be joined by Deb Combs, who is another IPV, and there we'll be doing a virtual tour called Women of Substance, again, celebrating the month, Women of Substance, Women in, uh, in the Art of the DIA. Well, thank you for joining us today, and uh, stay well and stay healthy. Thanks so much.